Okay. And we're going to let everyone in. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Welcome. Oh, a next on now. Okay. Hi. Uh, welcome to Conservation back. Career Chat. I am filling in for Monica McCubrey. I am Jamie Bachman. I'm a wildlife educator in a partnership position with Nebraska Game, Game and Perks and Northern Prairie's Land Trust. And today we are talking with Cheryl, Michelle Fierer Hurt. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and um, let you jump in and tell us your job title and uh, uh, what your education is, M Michelle. Let's just okay. right off the bat, let's do this thing. All right, thank you. Yes, I'm Michelle and I'm a wildlife biologist for the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. And I've been doing this job for 11 years. And I, I guess I started my path really through college. And I, I got a bachelor's degree in biology and I got a master's in ecosystem management. And I was in college when I decided that I wanted to go down this path sort of into the conservation world. And I started college. I went just into general biology and I thought I wanted to go and get a genetics degree because I really liked genetics. And I had one course in college where we had to be in a lab all afternoon, like three days a week. And it was just absolutely grueling. There were no windows. Everything was, you know, it, it was all very tedious. And I, I got out of that class. I survived it, but I thought there's no way I can do this. So I thought it was just pure torture to be in there. I couldn't see outside. I would go outside and say, oh, it's snowing. It's sunny. I had no idea all day. I hated it. And, and so at that point, I, I just sort of pivoted and went towards the outdoor stuff because that's what else I was interested in. I have a very similar experience, lab experience, and was like, this is not for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not for everyone. Where'd you go to, where'd you go to school? I got my bachelor's in Kansas at, at Baker University, and which is a small school. And then I got my master's at the University of Northern Iowa. Very good. So, and I grew up in South Dakota. I sort of did a tour of the Midwest <laughs> and then I lived in Nebraska. <laughs> um, so when you, when you left after you had your master's degree, what was your first job in the field? So my very first job, I had a three month internship and I worked at Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge, which is in central Iowa. And I worked there. I was the, let me see if I can, I haven't thought about this for a while. It's the, I was the land management and research demonstration biologist intern. <laughs> uh, and so I helped them with different things they needed with research and other things on the refuge. But that was just a three month stint. And then I got a job working for one year. I did I was an AmeriCorps volunteer and I did that for, like I said, one year and I worked out of a USDA office and I did private lands. So that was sort of where I got my start into my current position. I'd done some other jobs in college where I worked with private landowners and, and so that kind of all led in that direction. And your current job is is pr with private lands as well. Yes. Yep. I my job title says wildlife biologist, but it would be more accurate if it was private lands 
biologist because I do work with private landowners for the vast majority of my job. So if Nebraska, so Nebraska is mostly privately owned, how does, how, what do you do as a private lands biologist? So it depends day to day. There's a lot of variation, but <laughs> there's like any job, there's a lot of things that we routinely do every year at the same time of year. So we have our open fields and waters, it's hunting, trapping, fishing access. And I have to take care of the contracts that are in my part of the district down here. And that means I talk to the landowners, I sign them up for the program. I get all of the required paperwork. I work with the USDA offices, get maps and find out what they're already doing on their properties. See if there's anything we can help with, uh, financially speaking, to improve it for wildlife or for hunting. And then I manage the, the physical properties where we go out, post signs, uh, make sure that we have a, an atlas that we publish every year so that the hunting public can locate these properties. And so, so that's the Open Fields and Waters program. And that does take up a big amount of my time. Uh, I also work with landowners just kind of day to day all the way throughout the calendar year on improving their properties for, you know, we do it for wildlife habitat. A lot of times landowners are doing it for different reasons. You know, they might have a grazing operation. You know, they might be a hunter themselves. They might want to improve something for bird hunting or turkey hunting or something like that. And so we do those, and a lot of that is going to involve removing cedar trees, uh, doing prescribed fires. We help them set up the prescribed fires. Sometimes we help with the actual burn. Um, other times we just advise them on, you know, where they should put their burn breaks, what kind of weather they should be anticipating on the burn day. Uh, but yeah, we write contracts and provide funding you know, grant funding for different projects, it all just sort of depends. But those are the two main things that I do. So you mentioned open fields and waters, maybe some folks on here don't know exactly what that program is in, in relation to um, the map that's put out every year and um, mm -hmm. working with private lands. Can you give us a little bit of just some, the gist of what that program is? Yeah, yeah. So the Open Fields and Waters program is a program where we or the state of Nebraska actually, or the Game and Parks Commission actually leases the hunting rights from the landowner and then we post it and it's open to the public. So the public can access private lands through this program for hunting, fishing, trapping, uh, some properties are fishing only, some are hunting and trapping only. It just depends on what's available on the property and what the landowner is comfortable with. But then every year we make a payment to the landowner. So they're getting paid for it and the public is getting to hunt it. And, and yes, we do publish all of the properties in an atlas so that the public can figure out where these properties are located. And you can get those um, atlases at like Walmart or any any um, district office. They're free. You can also there's an online version as well, so you can see where any property is across the state. Is that right? Yep, yep. The online version mm -hmm. is going to be the most accurate version because there are properties that sell during the middle of the hunting season, and we have to make changes mid season. So online version is always the most accurate. And you know, for other folks. A really easy way to get the atlas is to go to the website, the outdoornebraska.gov, and click on contact us. And there's a spot where you can fill out which publications you want, and they'll ship them right out to you. And it honestly, it only takes like a week or less to get those materials. It's really fast, yeah. So, so what did you do yesterday, Michelle? <laughs> yesterday, I spent too much time trying to fix my printer and scanner. 
because we don't have IT down here. So it's usually just me and I can call IT and they can help me over the phone, but that doesn't always, it's not always what we need to do. So yeah, spend time doing that because I have to have a printer and I have to have a scanner. I have to scan all of my contracts and send them to Lincoln so that they can be on file and without a scanner, I'm, I'm sort of just sitting here, not doing anything. So I had to fix that before I could go out and do anything else, but I did make it out into the field and our hunting contracts, they all start the open fields and waters contracts. They all start this time of year. So I'm out now posting signs, fixing signs of properties that were in, in the past years, make sure that those are all up to date, make sure we have boundary signs everywhere so that we have fewer trespass problems, those kind of things. Um, so uh, what is, what are the, the best parts of your job, your favorite part of the job? And, and then, and, or maybe we should start with the least favorite and then we'll end with your favorite part. So what's the least favorite part of your job? And I think it's the same across the board for any biologist. I think it is. It has to be. It absolutely <laughs> yeah. has to be. I despise paperwork. <laughs> I don't want to do it, but I have to. It's almost half of my job is working on the computer. And that's, that's just the way it is. I, you know, field jobs, they, they're usually temporary and they don't pay as well. So I need to have a real job. This is my real job. It involves paperwork. So I tried to do it right the first time. So I don't have to do it again. <laughs> my least favorite part of my job. Uh, you know, I do enjoy going out and meeting with landowners getting to know them, getting to kind of get a feel for what they're working on, what their goals are, you know, how they use their land, you know, see if we have any grant funding that can help them towards their goals. Because a lot of times their goals are similar to ours. You know, we want to do good things for wildlife and, and that's what landowners have. They have the land where the wildlife lives. So those are some of the parts that I enjoy about my job. Very good. Um, what's the pay range for a job like yours? Uh, you know, I think that it varies state to state, but because I just saw somebody sent out jobs for another state. And I think that it's going to range about in the 40 to $50,000 range, but each state has their own kind of parameters set up for the job. So it does vary, but, but yeah, I think that's about where it's at. Do you have any advice? Um, I know I always, I always have um, kiddos and even adults and that want to know how to get in working um, um, as in conservation um, that come into the office all the time and, and have questions and want to know what they can do. What, what advice do you have for folks like that? Okay, so I always tell people, especially, you know, like college students, especially college students, get experience, any kind of experience that you can get, not only so you can figure out if it's something you really want to do, because like any job, it's not for everyone, but you have to have that experience. Everybody that has ever applied or been hired for any of our jobs they always have to have experience. So experience is really important. Uh, volunteer work can count as experience. And, and that's great. A lot of times that's how you get your first job. You volunteer first, you get the job later. That's actually how I got into it. When I was in college working on my bachelor's degree, we had a, I think it was a three week January term where students that were better funded than me went on vacation to the Caribbean and others like me, we stayed in the frozen Midwest and I did volunteer work because I had to do something. And I thought, well, I'd rather be outside than in the classroom. So I started calling people that I knew 
and telling them that I just had three weeks. I'm willing to do it unpaid. I just want to get some experience. Do you have anything for me? And I wound up at county level gov government and they had uh, they had an education division, they had law enforcement, and then they had forestry. So I had three weeks. They said, we'll take you. You can go to each division for a week and try it out, kind of ride along with people, do some of the work, and see what it is that you like. Because honestly, at the time, I had no idea. And, and I did find out very quickly that law enforcement was not for me. So that was good to know. Why? <laughs> yeah. Specific? <laughs> what was that? Anything specific or why it wasn't for you? Well, I thought it was just terribly boring and, and uh, <clears throat> was probably the person that I was with because they didn't really know what to do with a volunteer or a job shadow or whatever, you know, college student, he didn't know what to do with me. So he stuck me in the backseat of his truck and he was driving around for eight hours a day for an entire week. And I know the one day we got back to the office and he told, he goes, she fell asleep in the backseat. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? <laughs> so, so yeah, I thought it was just terribly boring. I didn't think they did anything. I know that's not the truth. Right, but, right. But that, you know, I don't know if it was a slow time or, right, or, right. but I was, I was bored. I what was, was your, do you remember, do you have like, this was the most fun out of that? Out of oh, that. by far the, the forestry was, uh, you know, like I showed up on the first day and they gave me a chainsaw. Yeah. I thought this is great. I thought this is awesome. So yeah, for a week we went and we took a UTV, loaded it up with saws, threw our lunches in, and we went out into the woods and cut trees off of trails that had fallen down over the winter. And, and you know, it was a lot of fun. I got to be outside, I got to move around and do things, and I thought that was great. The education part I thought was okay. Uh, maybe, maybe classrooms full of kids aren't for me. Some of the classrooms were awesome and some of them were totally out of control. <laughs> yeah. I, I never wanted to go back to those out of control classrooms. <laughs> so, so I thought that's not for me either, but I did enjoy the forestry quite a lot. And, and so I did the three weeks there, one week with each kind of division and then the following summer, I went back and I worked for the forestry department for the whole summer. So that's how I got that job. I, and I know it's how I got that job because they told me after I started that they had like 75 applications for these part-time or I guess full-time, but three-month positions. And the people that I, the full-time staff that I had to work with, uh, the boss asked them, who do you want to hire? And so they went through the stack of applications. They said, here's Michelle's, we'll take her. And they just sort of handpicked people out of that stack. So if I hadn't had that experience with them, they would have never considered hiring me. Yep. <clears throat> Got to get your foot in the door, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So that worked out great for me. Um, what's a fun project you, that, that you've worked on? Oh, so most of my, most parts of my job uh, are sort of routine. You know, I work on the open fields and waters. I'll never say that writing contracts is my favorite thing to do. Uh, so I usually like the things that are out of routine the best. Those are sort of my highlights. And there are different divisions within the Game and Parks Commission that sometimes need help. And so I'll go and help them on different projects. And I like doing those. So, you know, we'll go out and do like the pallid sturgeon broodstock. We'll go out for that and help out on the boat for a day. That though, that's also not for everyone. I could not be a full-time fisheries biologist. 
I've never been so cold in my life as I have been on those boats. Oh my gosh. They're the, they're so cold and you have to do the work regardless of the temperature or what happens that day. Uh, you know, we've, the first time I went out, I had been working with the commission for less than a year and it sounded miserable, the description they gave us. And then I went out and, and it was, it was every bit as miserable as they said it was. <clears throat> my hands froze, my fingers quit working. There were ice pellets shooting out of the sky and we're trying to finish out of gill nets. It was a mess. And, and I thought, how do these people do it every day? There's no way I could do it every day. I didn't like that. But other times I've helped them with, you know, turtle surveys and those are a lot of fun. I like doing those. Uh, I've gone out and done the catfish sampling, uh, a lot of prescribed fire we do and I enjoy doing that most days. Uh, but again, that's just like, you know, getting shot with ice pellets, not fun. So there are miserable parts to everything. Um, how did you set yourself apart from others who wanted the same job? Well, I'm not sure who else applied for my job, but my experience has been that you have to have past job or volunteer experience. So to get the job that I have now, I think the fact that I worked a private lands position for a year in another state prior to this, I think that's ultimately what, what got me the job. And I'd done another internship in college where I did some private lands uh, sort of monitoring information and data through the Fish and Wildlife Service. And, and so that helped too, because, you know, private lands, you have to be willing to call people and talk to them and work with them. You can't just go out into the field and be by yourself every single day. So I think that showed that I was willing to do the work. Um, how, where, in your, so you, did you know how to use the chainsaw and the equipment that you needed to use for your job before you started or were you, did they train you on the job? Because when so, I have kiddos come in, I always say the experience you need is you need to know how to fix small engines. You need to know how to work a chainsaw, sharpen a chain, ride an ATV, back up a trailer. Like, like these are all skills that you can put that you're going to need to know on the job. So did you know that, that kind of, did you have that experience going in? I didn't, I did not. And so like with the chainsaw, I showed up for that forestry job, my one week volunteer sort of time. And that was the first thing they did. There was a guy that uh, I worked with, he was a full-time employee and he took me out to a wood pile and said, we're going to learn how to cut a chainsaw. And we cut wood for like an hour until he thought that I was capable of not killing anybody with a chainsaw. <laughs> right, right. And, and he actually, for that was in Iowa. And so that guy at the time, he would go up to Iowa State University and he would train their forestry students on how to use chainsaws because he had all of his certifications and everything. So um, I think that it was a good person that trained me. And then, you know, the summer after that one week trial period, that's all we did all summer. We ran chainsaws all day, every day. And so we got to know the chainsaws inside and out. You know, we had to sharpen all of the saws every morning before we headed out to the field, but that, that's one way to be proficient in chainsaws. And, and it was that summer, I didn't know how to back a trailer. And there was a day I remember I had, I don't know, I had the great big truck. You can't see out the rear view mirror because we had a big chip bucket on there. So you couldn't see anything. So I was supposed to hit this double wide garage door with the trailer and I couldn't back straight into the garage. Like I missed this double garage door over and <laughs> over again. And, and they're like, well, if you keep trying, you're going to figure it out eventually. And I did figure it out. Uh, and I can back a trailer now. And the, the summer after that, I went and worked for 
the Fish and Wildlife Service, and that was on the Upper Mississippi Wildlife Refuge, and they sent me to do their motorboat operators training. And as part of that training, you have to be able to back a boat on a trailer through an obstacle course. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I did it. I passed. So it worked out. Yes. It's always the worst when someone's watching you while you're backing up, don't you think? Like, I'm like, I know yeah. how to back up a trailer. And then someone right. else is there and you're like, I don't know how to do it anymore. <laughs> I know, especially when they have a clipboard and they're checking everything off. Yeah, I can't imagine. And if you touch a cone, they knock you more points. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. When you are hiring someone, what impresses you most about, uh, about when you're looking for someone to hire? What impresses you most? I'm usually looking for someone that knows what they want to do, not somebody that just wants to, you know, has no experience and just wants to sort of try something out and see if they like it. I'm usually we get enough applicants that we can choose someone who knows what they want to do and has the experience and and can can work in the field. But, but again, experience, that's a big one. Um, how has your job or the field of conservation changed in the last five years? And do you, do you think, how do you think it'll change in the next five years? You know, when I, when I thought about how my job, my current job has changed just since I've started, the, the big thing I've started, I have started, started to spend more time in the office, but when I would write contracts previously, like when I first started, I would take these carbon copy contract papers out to the field with me, and I would sit in someone's driveway or at their kitchen table, and I would hand write all of these contracts and sign them, and I'd send, I'd give the landowner their copy, I'd keep mine, and I'd go back and I would snail mail all of these contracts to Lincoln. And now in order to do the same contract, I have to have GIS and I have to know how to use it. And I can't do anything in the field because I can't take my printer and scanner with me. But uh, I would say the technology has changed. I think that GIS is an absolute must. What's GIS? Just if there's anybody on that doesn't know what that is. <clears throat> oh, let's see. What is Just, <laughs> graphical information systems, I think. So it's a highly complex uh, mapping. I use it for mapping, but it can do a lot of things. It's, you know, used for data and it's, it's a software program. Um, but every big college offers GIS courses. And I took one when I was in grad school. And that was good to have as an introductory course. And then when I did my first private lands job at, the, at a federal office, they used it there too. And, and then I moved to Nebraska and I didn't have it. I had nothing. I had just a computer. You push the power button and the computer, like the desk, desktop came up. There was no passwords or anything. It was, it was sort of different, but I had to ask for a couple of years and I finally got GIS. And now I think I could ask for a few years and they'd never take it away from me because I have to have it. And, and so, you know, people that didn't have GIS in college, they still have to learn it and they have to adapt to using it. So, so if there's, you know, anyone around that's interested in conservation, I think technology is a must. That's good advice. That's really good. I wouldn't have thought of that. <clears throat> um, do, you, do you have any forecasts for the future, how you think things will change for your position or conservation in general? Oh my gosh, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. It's a tricky question, I think, too. You know? I, I hope. I know that I hope it doesn't go to all paperwork or office work. 
<laughs> right. I like leaving the computer in the office when I go out, but maybe someday they're all, you know, we're, we'll have our printer in our vehicle and we'll just write our contracts and have them sign them on the spot. Um, so you were talking about your lab, your lab experience and how that kind of let you know uh, that you didn't want to be um, in genetics or in, in, in the lab. Um, but what was that the, the pivotal moment like that you decided or was there a moment when you decided that you wanted you wanted to be a biologist or work in conservation? Mm, I don't think there was ever really a moment, but I, you know, growing up and in high school or, you know, when I was younger, I always knew that I enjoyed biology and I enjoyed being outside and I grew up in a family that spent a lot of time outside camping, fishing, hunting, you know, all of that stuff. So I always knew that I would enjoy doing that for a job too, but, but yeah, I mean, really that, that lab course in college was really what sealed the deal on an outside job. Um, what are some problems that in, in your position that you, that come up or that you frequently encounter? Well, there's always difficult people that you have to work with. And, and, you know, the job is really, um, really oriented around people. So, so having good people skills is important. And for, for me individually, um, you know, it's very clearly a male dominated field. So it's either adapt to it or find a different career path. So obviously I've chosen to adapt to it, but, but there's still challenges with it. Most, the vast majority of people I work with are great, but there's still people out there that if I'm using a tool, they'll walk up and they'll take it away because they don't think I can use it, or they make comments about how they think I can't pull a trailer down the road because I, I don't know what their reason is. That's, that's just what they think, but they would never question a male coworker about being able to drive a pickup with a trailer attached to it. So there are still things like that that happen, but uh, the plus side is the bathroom line is always short at conferences, a whole way, and it's great. I always think too that the women that are that do work in this field are always some of the the, the cream of the crop women that I've ever met in my life, and mm -hmm. I, and I just I think that it's it's amazing to get to be to get to be with those women because they're you know driven and persevere and intelligent and strong and so I always really enjoy conferences where there's just you know like six or ten women and you're like yeah <laughs> right right yeah um what's the job market like for your position or what other jobs uh, are related to career opportunities are related to like your, your position potentially well I think that this career path I think there's a lot of job openings you know, being a commission employee, I see all of the job postings that come out and there's a lot of jobs that get posted. Most of the jobs, however, are not biologist positions. And really, you know, I kind of view my job as an entry level position. So, you know, I got it shortly after college. So entry level. And I really like the field work. But if you want to move up, the first, if you move up, then the field work is gone and it's an office job. So, you know, everybody gets in, everyone that I talk to gets into this field because they like the field work, but that's the first thing that leaves. So most of the field based positions are temporary or term positions. You know, they may or may not have benefits associated with them. And so anybody that 
you know, needs to have a real job, needs to carry benefits, has kids, all of that. You need to have a permanent job and, and that's what I have and it's great. But if you were to move up, then you would lose a lot of the uh, best parts of the job, I think. I agree. <laughs> there's, there's, it, it seems like there's a lot of jobs that get posted, but they're probably mostly temporary. So people just, you know, they need to take temporary jobs until a full-time position comes open. You know, I've been in my job for 11 years. That means that my job has been full for 11 years. It hasn't been advertised. And, you know, I know a lot of people have been in their job for a lot longer than that. And so the permanent positions don't come open every day, but they're around if people are willing to move it's a lot easier to find a job. Um, do you have stressful parts of your job? How do you deal with them? Mm, there's, there's always going to be stress with jobs. And I think it depends on the person, but that's maybe one of the perks of having a job that's part field, part office. You know, I can... I can go out to the field if if something you get frustrated too, with your per, your printer when you get frustrated with your printer you can go out into the field yeah yeah i'll have someone else print my maps for me and i'll leave <laughs> <laughs> i haven't done that since last week <laughs> but yeah you know you can go out to the field you can do field work uh you know i can i can go and do a prescribed fire you can light you can light a fire and, and that'll be your stress relief, but sometimes that'll just cause more stress, the fire. <laughs> but, but yeah, you go outside, you forget about everything in the office, you go back and you deal with it later. Did you, did you have a mentor or a role model coming you up? Know, I, don't think, I don't think that I did. Um, people have asked me that before and I can't think of anyone Definitely not in this field that would be the mentor. Almost everyone that I worked with in college or jobs during or after college, they were all men. And, you know, you can relate to them through the job, but a lot of the everything else that goes into a job, because, you know, personal life is never totally absent from a job. Uh, you know, that, that was not relatable. So, so no, I don't think I ever did have a mentor. Um, so, uh, what, so maybe we already covered this, but just to make sure, um, how much of your, you know, what are the working conditions? Like how much of your job is paperwork or people work or inside versus outside? I've, I've never tried to you know, measure it exactly, but I think it's about half and half, about half the time I'm outside, about half the time I'm inside. Now, that doesn't mean <clears throat> a five-day work week, I'm inside for two and a half days. You know, some weeks I'll be inside for the entire week and other weeks I'll be outside for the entire week. It, there's a lot of variability. And if, if the weather is just completely miserable, then I'm probably going to be in the office. Most of the time, I don't have to do my work in miserable weather. So I usually choose not to. Last February, when it wouldn't quit snowing and it wouldn't warm up, I think I left the office one day that entire month. It was awful. But I think it was awful for everyone. So so yeah, it there's a lot of variability, but I would say that 75% of the time I'm working with other people, whether it be coworkers or landowners or, you know, other government agency personnel, it, you know, I'm working with somebody most of the time, but there's probably 25% of my time where, you know, I'm out in the field doing work by myself. How many hours a week do you work? 40 hours. <laughs> It's a full-time permanent job and it's 40 hours a week. Um, it can be 
it can be flexible to a degree. You know, sometimes we have surveys early in the morning or I have to leave early in the morning to go to drive to a meeting somewhere. Um, and so if, if I go in early, I try to leave early, or if I can't, then I have to shave the hours off somewhere else during the week. No, no overtime allowed. Um, how do you, uh, what's a family, you know, family career balance look like for you? How do you balance? Well, that, I think that depends, you know, I, you know, I have, I have kids, I have a husband, everybody has stuff going on. The kids are in preschool, school, summer camps, daycares, they've got sports or swimming lessons, you know, there's always something going on. And that is, I, I would say that's one of the perks of my job is that it can be flexible you know, as needed, if somebody's got a doctor's appointment at three o'clock in the afternoon, I'm going to quit working and take them to the doctor's appointment. And that's just the way it is. You know, if, if I have to go to the dentist, I usually just go and by the end of the week, I still have 40 hours in. But, but yeah, it's, you have to have some flexibility with a job, I think. Yeah. Um, do you still um, um, keep training? Like, um, are you still learning and, and growing in your career? Yeah, I think that, I think that's the case. And I do remember when, when I left college, you know, I just, I was leaving this environment where everything is getting crammed into your head as fast as possible. And I thought, oh my gosh, when I graduate, like I'm never gonna learn anything again. I'm not gonna learn anything. I'm not gonna be going to lectures. I don't have exams. You know, I, I still wanna learn stuff. And so now rather than going to class and having exams, I, I go to conferences and eat cookies. And I, I think I prefer the latter. I'd, I'd rather go to the conferences, meet other people, talk to them, um, uh, hear about different research that people are working on or projects that they've put on the ground, figure out the results of those and, you know, see if there's anything that I can apply to any of my projects. So the opportunity is still there to learn. I don't, however, have any, you know, it's not like a teacher that has to have continuing education credits or anything like that. We don't have anything like that. But I do, I do like to learn and kind of adapt my, my plans for, for different projects based on, on different research that's coming out. You know, science and stuff. <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> um, do you have anything else you want to add? I might open it up to see if there's any questions from anybody that's on. I don't, I don't think so. I covered everything. Awesome. Um, so folks that are on, if you want, you feel free to, um, enter a question into the chat or, um, go ahead and unmute yourself and you, cause we're just a small group today. Um, Nick asks, are private landowners becoming more or less interested in open fields and waters or supporting wildlife in general in the time you've been working on it? I can't say if they're becoming more or less interested or open to wildlife habitat. For the most part, landowners that I talk to, they enjoy wildlife, they enjoy seeing the wildlife, and they want the wildlife to stay. They don't, they don't want to see it go away. And, you know, a lot of times we might have, I might have grant money that is geared towards like the timber rattlesnake. And so we'll clear pastures where there might be nice rock outcrops in an area where we know there's a timber rattler population. And the landowner is doing the tree clearing because they want more grass for their cattle. But because they're working with me, we do the project in a way that 
is going to have, you know, a net benefit for the snake. We might not ever talk about snakes when we're out there and the landowner might not like snakes, but they're still doing the project. It's still benefiting those, those critters. And, and specifically about the open fields and waters, mm. most of our landowners that participate in that program are going to be older, more typically retired farmers that have CRP. There's others that absolutely go into it, but uh, usually we get the most interest in the program when there's a higher level of CRP signups in the area. So that's tied to CRP and, and age, I think. Oh, here's a good question from Megan. Um, what part of Nebraska or what district do you work in? Oh, yeah, I don't think we talked about that. Mm -hmm. I am in the Southeast District for the commission and I actually work, I'm, I'm based out of a field office in Beatrice. So that's, that's where I am day to day and my coverage area, there's some gray area, but my core area goes from about Thayer County east to the Missouri River. And then I basically have two tiers of counties up. So like Richardson, Nemaha, Pawnee, Johnson, Gage, Selene, Jefferson, kind of that kind of bottom tier of counties in the state. Do we have any other questions? Oh, we do. Um, Nick was wondering um, if, if you participate in research projects for your job too. So yes, uh, mostly when I participate in research projects, it would be me collecting data and providing the data to someone in Lincoln and usually someone at UNL will crunch the numbers for us and give us information back. So <clears throat> I think it was just last year that the commission started a new prairie grouse monitoring initiative. And I'm, I'm not the one to ask about the details <clears throat> on that one, but uh, different biologists across the state have all been going out and doing these, you know, conducting the actual survey. So we get our data sheet we go to our section, we contact the landowners, we ask for permission to access their properties. We go out and we listen and look for the leks and count individuals and, and stuff like that. And we had a different, a few years ago, we had a quail uh, kind of research project and that was, it kind of straddled Jefferson and Thayer counties. And that one, we, People like me, we would go out and do spring bird surveys. We'd go out and do fall bird surveys. And then there were researchers from UNL that were hired and they went out and did some of the veg surveys that were done. So it's highly variable what part of it you might be involved with. But if there's something that is really interesting to me that I want to participate in some kind of research, then, you know, I can ask and most often the commission is supportive of those, those interests. Any other questions? And um, we do have a few minutes, um, about 12 minutes left. Did you want to share your, your photos? Yeah, I can share my photos if I can do it right. Okay. Oh, I don't think I'm at the beginning. Move on. Okay. Does it fail? Let me start this over again. <laughs> Okay, can you see Yay. that? Yes, we can. Okay. So this is, I just threw some photos together. These are not in any specific order. And 
And I just threw some photos together that were examples of work that I've done in the past or different things like that. So if you have any questions, just let me know. This is a photo of Alex Sturgeon. This is part of the Sturgeon brood stock that used to happen along the eastern edge of Nebraska in the Missouri River. So we'd go out for a whole day and we would hopefully catch some of these if they were the right everything, then someone would come with a truck and we'd drop them off and they'd send them to the hatchery so that they could spawn and produce little sturgeon that they would then reintroduce to the river. Don't tell fisheries because I probably totally butchered that, but that's, that's, that's my take on it. Uh, we, I do a lot of prescribed fire. And so this is just a quick fire photo that I grabbed and um, yeah, we help private landowners set up burns. We often help them with the actual burn. And I do help with prescribed fire on public lands too, as needed. So that's something that we do. So that's probably something that I skipped when we were talking. If you can get prescribed fire experience, that would definitely be a must. I don't think there's anywhere in the state that doesn't use prescribed fire. Oh, and so I included this photo because when you go out and visit landowners' properties, you never know what you're gonna see. And this is what I found in the middle of a quarter. I don't know what they were doing, but you never know what you're gonna see. Some things are good, some things are bad. Some, some things are a little on the scarier side, but uh, not sure what they're thinking, but they buried their tractor. Um, this was part of catfish sampling. And that was just a day that I went out with fisheries to, to help them out. Uh, this is just an example of, it was actually a tree clearing project. I know there's still trees, but as a tree clearing project, all of the cedar trees were removed. Any of the invasive trees like hedge or honey locust, those were all moved. And then the farmer started to use prescribed fire too. So we kept the oak trees and we have a, an oak savanna here. Uh, this is a photo from when I worked in with the Fish and Wildlife Service in Northeast Iowa. And this area was a really neat area to work in. Uh, they had what they called algific talus slopes. And so they were loose, rocky slopes. And that's where I was at in this photo. And they had some threatened and endangered species that resided on these slopes. And Part of my job was monitoring the plants, counting how many of the, is um, this monk's hood plant, see how many of those were in bloom. So I'd go up and fill out data sheets and write that down. And if I found any new locations then I would take GPS coordinates of it. Uh, there was also the Iowa Pleistocene snail that we would look for. But these slopes were unique because the soil temperature never got above about 38 degrees all summer. And <clears throat> so these bluffs have sinkholes on top of them. And there's a big block of ice inside the hill. And then out the side of the hill, there's this talus, the loose rocks. So in the summertime, the airflow would go from outside down the sinkhole across the ice and out the loose rocky slope. And so when I would go up the slopes, it might be 100 degrees outside, but it was about 75 where I was working. Because what are those hills called again? <laughs> those that, I'm gonna have to nerd out on that. That is really cool. You will, they're really cool. Uh, Algific talus slopes. Thank you. Yeah, um, so those, that was a really cool job. I'd lived in Iowa for several years at that point and I'd never heard of them. And, and I thought it was fantastic to go there and see them. There's actually, there's bigger 
blocks of rock where it actually forms like a cave. And, and so you could walk up to these things and it'd be, you know, 90 degrees, 100 degrees, and you'd get within like 20 feet of these. And there was so much cold air blowing out that you'd get goosebumps just walking up to them. I mean, it's a lot of cold air. So way back when, before air conditioning and everything, people would build their houses up against these slopes and they would basically open like a, a window and they'd let cold air in and that was their air conditioning. Uh, so anyways, that was, a, that was a neat job to have something different. Uh, this is a different landowner that I worked with. This goes along the lines of you never know what you're gonna see when you go and meet with a landowner. Uh, this person had chicken tractors and he was working on converting a brome field to prairie and normally I would have somebody do that conversion using chemicals because he was looking at about 30 acres and instead he wanted to use the chicken tractor and so we had to get special permission to use a chicken tractor because the federal government does not have any checkbox for a chicken tractor so he had everything timed out he knew how long it was going to take him to get through this but he was using the chickens to eat all of the seeds out of the seed bank to kind of tear up the ground when they were just kind of scratching around and they'd eat all the bugs. I assume they eat, ate some of the vegetation. Maybe a chicken can sc scratch it all the way, but he showed me and the ground was basically bare when he moved this chicken tractor. And he moved it, I think, every three days. So that was one project, but it was a little different. Um, other things that I do, I have always at least occasionally had to do public events. And that would be something similar to what I'm doing right now, but also public events out in the field where we do prairie walks, take people out, kind of introduce them to the prairie because there's a lot of people that they're just not familiar with it. They've not been to a prairie. So that's what this is a photo of. And, you know, sometimes I get to go to different workshops, conferences, and there are extra activities. In the evening, that's what this photo is. We were black lighting for moths. And so we set up a white sheet out in the middle of a prairie and we had battery operated black lights and a couple entomologists. And we put the black lights up and we'd watch the sheet and we'd catch insects, they'd identify them. It was, I'd never been out in the middle of a prairie at midnight before. And so that was different. It was interesting to see because there's different things to see. Uh, there's definitely different noises that you're not used to hearing in the daylight, but, but it was fun to go out and try that. Um, this is just another, this was actually uh, birding day. We do birding day every year, except for during COVID. And we take the general public and employees out and we just go birding for a day. And I am involved with organizing that event most years. And that's what this photo is. And then let me see if I can zoom in. Jamie told me my picture is small. So this is a scissor fly catcher. And I would say this is one of the perks of the job is that when you're out and about, you get to see cool things and you, and you never know what you're gonna see. I think that my coworker and I were eating lunch at a field entrance uh, one day and we saw this bird start flying around and I had my camera. So I thought, oh, I'll take a picture. And so I took this photo and I don't know, I think it was when we, came back around to that birding day that I was just talking about. One of the birders that we invite with to um, identify birds for us, uh, he said, well, scissor tail flycatchers, he said, we're, we're tracking those because they're moving further north. So if you have any locations of those, we have someone that wants to go out and see the nest and count the eggs and you know, so I gave, I said, well, this is the photo that I took. That's it, right? And so they ended up going out and looking at the nest that we'd found. And 
they go out every year and check the same nest because it's been there for several years. So there's always kind of interesting things that happen when you're out and about. All right, so this is my last photo and I thought I would share a photograph of my office. <laughs> this is not a glamorous job, <laughs> but uh, this is the outside of my office. I think it looks better on the inside, but uh, yeah, I never know where people work. I don't know what their offices look like. I don't know what their arrangements look like. So I thought I would share mine and this is it. So that's all I have for photos. If you guys have any questions, let me know. Well, I do believe we are right at an hour. So I wanna respect everyone's time. Um, thank you all for joining us. We get lots of thank yous and that's really cool about the hills that you were talking about um, in the chat. Aaron and Nick say thank you. Sarah says thank you. Um, so thanks for coming and hanging out, Michelle. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me and thanks for moderating. Yes, um, this is, this is, uh, uh, will be on, um, this recording will be on a, uh, the Nebraska Game and Parks Education YouTube page. So if you want to review it, um, all of the conser conservation career chat um, uh, episodes are on, on that, uh, yeah, Lindsay, on that, uh, Nebraska Game and Parks Education YouTube page. So have a, a very lovely day, everyone. Thank you. See you later. Bye.